Hello there, everybody. Carlton Pearson. Welcome to Streaming Consciousness. An alert, not alarm, just becoming more alert, aware, in tune, connected. And we like to always talk about tapping, stretching, evolving, becoming more of who you are, and understanding what that means. Uh, and it's an evolving, ongoing thing. You never really arrive. You just keep on going. That's where I am. Going to talk more about rethinking and reinvestigating and tapping. That's good physically for your whole body. Each week I remind you, tap, move. Move your thinking. Move your blinking. (laughs) Notice how your eyes blink constantly. You're twitching. That's not a bad thing. You're evolving. You're shifting. You're moving. You've got blood vamping and coursing through your veins constantly every day, all day. You have a trillion cells in you. You lose about 500 million a day. And so you keep changing. You keep evolving. Your outer skin, the layers, some people call that ash, dead skin. It's really not dead. It's just transitioning skin. And you get a whole new skin surface every 30 days. Part of that is growing. When that when that skin, we think it dies and becomes white, that means it has been sort of evolving the last 30 days. 29 to 30 days. That's my friend Charles Holt singing, as we say each week. He does a great job. We love him very dearly. And he's an evolved person, constantly growing. Well, we just got back from South Africa. My wife and Gina and my two children, our two children, Julian, our oldest and a Majesty, our daughter. We all went together at the invitation of my friend Musi Cindy, uh, who has just written a book titled Jesus for a Digital Age, to which I will refer throughout tonight's talk. And I'm going to, in fact, begin um, teaching from this book or lecturing on it for the next little bit. And then uh, we'll provide a way for you to actually, you can go to Musi Cindy, that's M U Z I. C-I-N-D-I. Musi Cindy. He's a South African. And you can go to, you can Facebook and like him. And eventually you can download this book or e- as an ebook. And uh, I wrote the forward for it, but that's not why I'm encouraging it. I read it, the whole thing again, the finished product on our way back from Gina and I both on our way back from South Africa. An incredible presentation of both history and science and some elements of theology. In fact, while we were there, we heard him give a lecture on the history and science of thought regarding scripture, the Bible, the history, the science of religion. And it was less theological than it was historical and scientific. Gina spoke to about 3,000 women in a ladies' empowerment gathering. They packed the place out. My daughter sang. I did a leadership day seminar just with leaders, bishops and pastors and some business people, some of the top gospel singers. In fact, the top gospel uh, music uh, recording artist in South Africa was there. And we had a lot of interaction. There's a lot of questions out there and, and a, a lot of rethinking. This book's called Jesus for a Digital Age. And he actually talks about something that I've been doing, which is building a cyber church without walls i don't want to pastor a physical building anymore i did that for 35 years and i'm capable of doing that but then the new church i'm looking at you in cyber and they're all over the world we have quite a following in south africa i've been preaching there since the 70s the late 70s and this man musi cindy heard me back then and he's evolved he was a big oral roberts uh follower as i have been a protege of him for many years and uh, the other bishop jackson was a big a T.L. Osborne follower, and uh, they had their books and worked in their office and volunteered their time. They, too, have evolved. Bishop Jackson had several churches that he oversaw throughout the country and outside of the country, but I'm seeing a lot of bishops and leaders and pastors and apostles or whatever you want to There were several apostles there, uh, people who've been known by that with hundreds of churches collectively or, that we all relate to, and pastors are rethinking. Now, a lot of them cannot come out and actually say that they're rethinking because, uh, and not that they have a theological issue with me, it's actually a business decision. They would lose their pensions, their parsonages, uh, their ministries, their parishes. So they have to walk very carefully. I hear from them all the time. Many people are rethinking what they believe and why they believe it, as you hear me say quite often. So I want to talk a little bit about rethinking. It's called repentance. Repentance doesn't mean to say I'm sorry. 
it may include that for some people, it actually is the word metanoe in Greek. Meta means to change or after. Sometimes it means after. To perceive afterwards, to rethink, or after you have thought, think again. To reconsider. It's called an afterthought. I'm 61 years old, and I'm having all kinds of afterthoughts. I'm rethinking what I was told and what I was taught, which what I believed. But it's not what I recall in my soul. I believe your soul has a memory like your cells have a memory. And I believe your soul and your cells converse with each other. And the deep down in the re- deepest recesses of your soul or your psyche, the soul is the Greek word psyche, for, uh, suke, excuse me, from which we get the English word psyche, the thought, psychology, the logic of thought. In your deepest thoughts is knowledge, not just what you're told and taught or believe. There is a there is a knowledge that transcends belief. There is a knowledge that is beyond and besides belief. What you believe is what you've been told or taught. What you know is what you recall and reclaim and recollect and reconnect to in the deepest recesses, the farthest reaches and regions and rhythms of consciousness. You know you're okay. You know everything is okay. You know that you lack nothing. That you're completely whole. What we do in the lifespan and the time momentum uh, or time continuum, I should say, is we keep reclaiming, recollecting our soul, recovering ourselves. I consider myself self a recovering fundamentalist in the fact that I'm, I'm, I was addicted to fundamentalism. I was addicted to religion like a drug, which I've never been addicted to a drug or alcohol, but you understand the concept. People are addicted to religion. The situation in Iran today between the, with the Kurds and the Sunnis and, and uh, the uh, uh, Shia Muslims, Um, It's a religious war throughout the Middle East and most of the wars that have been fought throughout human history, or at least the last few hundred years or 2,000 years or more, has been based on religion. Religion is the culprit, which is man's search or reach out to some entity that they call God. We're always trying to find God, appease a difficult, a, a, an angry one, or please a difficult one. That's what religion is. That's why religion exists institutionally, not spiritually, but institutionally, the general consensus throughout humanity's history has been that there is a God with an anger management issue, a God who can be angered and ticked off. And, and when that God is ticked off or angered, it throws tantrums and earthquakes and natural disasters and tornadoes, you know, tsunamis, floods, famine. Uh, we're very afraid, so we've developed various codes models and mod- modalities to supposedly appease this angry God or please the difficult one. And that's, that has crippled and encrypted the culture, the human culture, for many, many millennia. So if this new age that we're living in, and I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with that term, but uh, this is a new age. Even Jesus said, I'm with you to the end of the age. The King James Version mistranslates uh, it end of the world, which is the Greek word cosmos. When I refer to the Greek, I'm referring to the, what, what's called the Septuagint, that Jews had Greeks because Jews during the Greek empire began to speak more Greek, read and understand more Greek than Hebrew. So the, the Hebrew leaders and rabbis and uh, um, fathers had it translated from, from uh, the, the, the scriptures from Aramaic and Hebrew into Greek. And uh, so we have the whole Old and New Testament written in Greek. It's not an, 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 a, a completely accurate translation of the Aramaic or the Hebrew, but it's as best they did and maybe can do, because Hebrew is not a quote-unquote modern language. So we're talking about a Jewish perception of divinity. Remember when you read scripture, which we're going to read here in just a minute, um, the Bible was written, the, the Christian Judeo-Christian Bible was written by Jews, even the New Testament, for Jews, to Jews, about a Jewish understanding of divinity, divine things, things that can be divined or detected or can be pre-known. Many people don't know that the, uh, the, uh, the whole word uh, divinity uh, or the divine uh, comes from a Latin and French term in English, uh, means to predict. We're always trying to predict or forecast or um, predict the unpredictables. There are a lot of unpredictables that we predict. It's from a Latin word, de- devenere, 
or divenare, um, which means to, to, to know in advance or to predict in advance or to think ahead and, you know, you, you speculate. God is something we speculate. Who can define? It's hard to even describe God without describing everything. We, we don't necessarily have to know God, but we can experience God or recall, recover our God self. The closest to God anybody may ever get is what I call self-actualization, becoming familiar with who you are, to know you as family, to accept you. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, he's quoting an Old Testament passage, as you love yourself, the whole emphasis is as you love self. Who is self? Who is soul? Who is the essential, immutable, immeasurable, immediate you? Right now, today, the one you have always been and will always be. Your evolution is only understanding more clearly. Evolution is resolution, a more resolved view. When you ask for resolution and or high definition, high resolution television, it means you can see it a little bit more clearly or with greater clarity. Here I am in my 60s and I hang out with people who, who are in their 60s and they are asking even at 60 and 70 and 80 for more clarity. Why are we here? What's this all about? Those are wonderful, curious questions. Religion sort of stops and says, okay, well, here's all the answers. Here's the certitude. Everything is as it is. And some things, in some ways that's true. But when you lose your curiosity, you start dying. Anything that stops growing begins dying. So growing and evolving and expanding and extending yourself and your soul is very powerful. I'm actually enjoying it. Uh, this book is called Jesus for a Digital Age, Musi Cindy. You need to read it. It just goes into so much history, nothing boring about it. It's fascinating, the insights he brings forth. And you're going to be able to download that if you go to his site, Musi Cindy, M-U-Z-I, Musi, S-I-N-D-I, and friend him or ask to be friended by him. Now, here's one of the things that's in the very top of the book. And it's actually um, a, um, a, a quote of a man named Herbert Seeley Bigelow, who lived in the 18... He, he was born in 1870, uh, transitioned in 1951, just two years before I was born. Uh, the Religion of Evolution, he wrote this, and it's pretty powerful. I think you'll love it. I've been called a heretic, and when I was first called that, it was just a demon in my mind because I've been using that term toward people who I consider unbelievers or who believe differently. And that's basically Harry Isos in Greek or Isis, which means choice or opinion. Ops is a Greek word for I. Opinion or option, it's a different view than the traditionalist view. My views have changed. I'm rethinking, repenting. When you think, think again. After you thought, think one more time. Uh, Matthew 3, 1 through 3 says this. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent. That doesn't mean to say I'm sorry. It means to reconsider what you think and why. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. That basically is a metaphor for higher consciousness. Not a, a literal place with thrones and a big uh, and a God with a long white beard and a scepter there making judgment. That's superstitious mythology. It's a reference to the, a higher way or realm of thinking. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus was saying this back in his day. There's a new way of thinking, a higher way than his particular religious discipline suggested. I would say that 2,000 years hence about Christianity. He was saying it in reference to Judaism. Or I would add Islam or Hinduism or any of the isms. There's a higher way of thinking. Repent. Rethink. Because the kingdom of heaven, the higher way of thinking, is at hand. It's on, we're on the verge. That's why there's so much discomfort on the planet. is because people are resisting this urge and urgency of expanding their thinking. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah. He's referring to a prediction or a prophecy in the past, some 700 years earlier in the day of Isaiah. Jeremiah would be... 500 years earlier, but 700 years earlier, for this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. It's not just desert. It's the wild places of thought. Less tamed. <laughs> I've been in that less tamed realm of thinking. My wild thoughts. 
in the wide open spaces where I'm not confined to any particular mental discipline. But I can be curious. I can ask questions. I can rethink what I believe. One crying in the wilderness, make ready. The word prepare means to basically repair. Prepare the way of the Lord. That means repair like potholes and and rough roads so that the consciousness that's coming toward you would come with less cumbersome ways. When we filled the pond, and then in the ancient world, whenever the king would go into the little townships and villages from the, the capital city where he sat perched on his throne, they would shout, prepare. And the community people would come out and repair the rough dirt roads so that the carriage bringing the king would, would ride more smoothly into their cities where the king would often bless them or curse them. Now, this comment, prepare ye the way of the Lord, is saying, repair the roads and routes to which you access your divine self. Because those roads are worn, and they're ruts, and they're potholes, and they're chuckles, and and, uh, it's difficult to receive this elevated way of thinking when you've got all this old layers of religion and, and dogma and doctrines and encryptions of mind that prevent Thousands of people want to think differently, but the road and route by which new thought can come to them is so cluttered with millennia, centuries, and uh, and, and decades of old, worn-out ways of being, stagnated and, and in a rut. So when we talk about expanded consciousness, we're talking about rethinking, moving stuff out of the way. This is a very interesting um, comment that Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan said, a religion is as much, and I like to quote rabbis because, again, as I said earlier, our Bible comes to us through rabbis or through Jewish religious people. Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism. It is a form of Judaism that many Jews don't embrace, of course, but many Jews do. Christianity or Christ, Mashiach, is a Jewish term. It's a Hebrew term for the the anointed one. All cultures have sought an anointed one. Somebody that's going to come as a sort of godlike person, usually a male, to represent or represent divinity. Because we don't look into our own selves and souls for divinity. We look for it outside of ourselves. This whole expanded consciousness thing is to, to see yourself as a, an expression of the divine, of your own uh, ability to predict or to know both before and afterwards who you are. The, the unedited you. The raw, original, genetic, or genuine genes and genetics and, and uh, actually genitalia, which is the, the physical way through which human beings come into the planet. That's, that's the whole idea of being genuine. It means origin, genesis, genetics, beginnings, your authentic or authorized self. The author is the founder or it's the writer. Who, 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 who inscribed. So when we think about original ideas, sponsoring thoughts that, that spawned our existence into this reality that we call Earth, the Earth realm, we're moving religion and some of the dogmas and doctrines out of the way so we can access that better self, that real best, not just better, your best self. You want to experience yourself. That's why I always ask the question, what do you believe about you? Why do you believe that about you? And how do those beliefs about you add to or subtract from the quality of your life? Again, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan says this, a religion is as much a progressive unlearning of false ideas concerning God as it is the learning of true ideas concerning God. Or I like to say concerning divinity. The term God is is a a title uh, trying to describe an indescribable reality. We call God, we call it God or Yahweh, or the, the Muslims would say Allah. Uh, some Christians call God Jesus. We put all kinds of titles on the, and, and provided terms or terminology to try to describe this, this inner knowing that there's something larger than can be contained in a human body. It is an essential reality that we all are attracted to. That's why we create all these religions. Religion is man's attempt to reach or find God. Spirituality is is you, the essence, finding itself. 
embracing itself, uh, realizing and actualizing itself. Very powerful. I'm using a lot of terms, and these are fresh terms because we're developing a different language. A, we are expanding the conversation. John 1 says, In beginning was the word of the logos, the logic, the rationale, the reasoning. In beginning was the utterance or the, the conversation. What conversation are you engaged in? Even the conversation you have with yourself. In beginning was the conversation. The conversation was God, was with God, and the conversation was God. In other words, God is conversing with itself through us and as us. I am a conversation of God. Now, my friend Donald, Neil Donald Wash, I say my friend, I love him so much. I met him, spent some time with him a few months ago in, in the Washington, D.C. area with my friend Michael Beckwith. Donald was one of the speakers. He wrote the book called Conversations with God. And uh, it's been a bestseller. They've sold millions of copies all over the world. He has a series of them. He was one of the speakers. I got to spend some private time with him. A brilliant man, brilliant thinker, a very, thinker, a very mystical, spiritual man. I love the conversations. He's the one who said that separation theology leads to separa- separation psychology, separation sociology, separation pathology. This whole idea that you are separate from God or separated from God, that's an illusion. You cannot be separate from God. Either, neither can you be separate from me. We are individuals, but we are interconnected, inextricably, inseparably connected to each other. It's called universalism. One verse, version, or versification of the whole. That's the way I describe universalism. I'm a universalist in that sense. I felt absolutely one with all of our friends in South Africa. They, they used to describe them as blacks, whites, and colors. Uh, but there's all kinds of people from all over the world. China is doing a lot of work in South Africa right now. We saw more Asians than I normally would see when I traveled in South Africa. And I've been going there since 1978. But I've seen, in, I've seen it in Europe. I've been around the world. And I sense every place I go, every country on every continent that I've gone to, and I've been to all of them, I feel a connectedness. It's like I'm having a deja vu. It's like I remember being there. Or being them. It's a beautiful sense of comprehensive love. Again, I love the quote by Rabbi Mordecai. A religion is as much a progressive unlearning of false ideas about God, or I would say divinity, as it is the learning of true ideas concerning divinity. Yours, your own ability to predict or to to, um, divine is what they call it to sense what's before and what's after as well and connected that into what is now, which is past and present. Eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. That's what eternity is. We will always be. We're connected with everything that has ever been or will ever be. It's all one. That's a beautifully relaxing reality or suggestion uh, for my soul. John Baptist says, rethink. Jesus came after him saying, again, repent. The kingdom of heaven, the higher reaches and regions and rhythms of consciousness is at hand. All we have to do is wake up. And we're doing that. Now, in that book, Jesus for a Digital Age, let me, let me again, finish quoting this whole idea about heresy. Um, because I've been called one and now I'm wearing it like a badge of honor. <laughs> you, sir, it hurt my feelings initially because I had a certain opinion of heresy that a group of bishops actually, uh, ex officially, because they had no official authority to make me heretic, but they did it and they felt pretty good about it. Their eagles were stroked, and I was kind of fascinated. I was actually amused that they would make such a fuss over what I was trying to. I was just beginning to think expanded consciousness, not, not by that terminology. I called it the gospel of inclusion. Initially, I, it was Jesus, Savior of the world, the whole cosmetic makeup of the planet, not just a few Christians. And I wrote a book called God is Not a Christian, Nor Jew, Muslim, Hindu. God is with us, in us, around us, as us. I still believe that. And it's such a relaxing thing. I have no negative judgments, uh, at least not at the level that I once did. I'm still evolving and cleansing and purifying and rethinking and re- repenting. But I don't walk around with the same kinds of judgmental tensions I, I, I feel permission and commission to love everybody. 
for the first several 50 years of my life, I never felt permission from my religion to love every and anybody. I felt that I was should be exclusive and love only believers. And uh, the Bible says, show love and kindness to everybody, especially those of the household of faith. It didn't say exclusively those. It said especially. I do have a special relationship with those of the quote-unquote household of faith. Of course, that meant Christianity. Now, I consider the household of faith everybody who believes in themselves, believes in a broader, bigger God that's, that then one can find to any particular religion, but as a combination of all of them. Because that's this man's pursuit, human's pursuit, hunger, desire, irresistible attraction to their own divinity. We think it's a divinity outside of ourselves. It's really our own divinity. We want to be more fully self-expressed and experienced. Religion won't let you express and experience yourself as you really are. You impersonate who you think others want you to be. But getting free of those impersonations or walking around as an imposter is a real born-again experience. It may be the only one. Or the, the deepest one, when you really awaken to who you are and who you are not and don't see any difference between who you are and who you're not. Because you're everything and everybody and connected to all that is. When we awaken to that, awaken to that corporately as, or collectively as a human race, the energy on the planet will shift. All this global warming that we're talking about, that is the universe correcting itself. It isn't the judgment of gods or the gods. It is the universe correcting itself moisturizing itself, more water. It seems like floods and devastation and, and uh, 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 um, tragedy. It's a shift. We're not in trouble as a planet. We're in transition. Everybody talks about the fall of the Roman Empire. What is that supposed to mean? The Roman Empire is still headed up by the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> we still live in it. We still live in part of the Greek Empire. It's just where you put your emphasis. And all other empires from Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, uh, I mean Rome, Greece. Or it's Greece and then Rome. And then some people believe it's Papal Rome, the, the Holy Roman Empire, the Ca Roman Catholic Church. And then some people believe America, the Western world, dominated or influenced by the Roman culture. And I mean, we'd have to study a lot of history, and I have, and you should. Uh, because it makes a lot more sense when we study history. And that term history means his story. It's actually a, rep a reference to Jesus. Because the calendar shifted 2,000 years ago. There are other calendars that predate the modern Roman calendar. But because of the influence of Christianity, which is waning, the, even the Roman Catholic Church and its new Pope Francis is shifting and shaking the whole movement. They're having to reconsider a lot. Something very powerful is occurring in the universe. Oh, my God. And we're all a part of it. My soul has never been so happy. My soul has never been more happy. When I say soul, I'm talking the psyche, the suke, my thought life, my mind, the seat of my reflective and moral conscience. My, my, my consciousness about people or conscience means with knowledge, science, conscience, with knowledge, not belief alone, not beliefs dominating, but what you know, what you know has to be renowned or reclaimed or reconsidered or rethought or recollected, reconnected with. Mm, I get excited thinking about reclaiming my and recovering my soul. That's so beautiful for anybody who dares to do it. Now, heresy is the youth of truth. Orthodoxy, orthos means straight, like an orthodontist. You go to the orthodontist and they straighten your teeth. I'm saying orthodoxy is supposed to be straightened, straightened truth. Orthodoxa, doxy, the, the, the glory of the doxa, the clarity, the illumination of, of uh, truth. Youth is, uh, heresy is the youth of truth. Orthodoxy is the decrepit old age. Heresy is thought. Orthodoxy, tradition, is habit. Traditions, that which has been traded down orally over the years. Traditions. Um, we call it oral tradition, things that have been spoken. Heresy is initiative. Start. Orthodoxy is inertia. Inertia means the tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. Are you restless? Are you eager to, and you don't know why? You don't even know what it is. It's like I'm, 
I, there's an irresistible draw for more. We want more. And something is pulling us onward and upward. Heresy is that which is to be. Orthodoxy is that which is passing away. When you hear a lot about heresy, that means something is coming. Change is coming. Again, we're not in trouble. We're in transition. So you haven't even heard that much about heresy. I hadn't until the last 10 years of my life when I suddenly became announced or pronounced as a heretic. That means change is on its way. Some of the people who were asking me questions the other day in South Africa were people who, were, who had followed my music and or ministry since they were three and four and five. I mean, these were grown adult men and women, but they'd been following me through television or something since they were children, even in South Africa. Because TBN went over there. I was in the, for the, over the last 40 years, I was involved off and on with TV. Actually, my first appearance on TBN was 1980, when they were just beginning with small stations around the country. And since then, I've seen it grow. Trinity Broadcasting Network, Paul and Jan Crouch. I did the PTL program with Jim and Tammy Baker, CBN, this is what used to be called the 700 Club, with the Christian Broadcasting Network with Pat Robertson. My mom helped support all those organizations and ministries when they started. My involvement with Oral Roberts and mother supported Oral Roberts and T.L. Osborne and Morris Cirillo, all of whom became my friends and really heroes. I still adore them all. Morris Cirillo is the last one of that particular category that's still alive. R.W. Shanback has gone on, uh, Oral Roberts has gone on, Dan Hagen, T.L. Osborne. Um, but I was involved and blessed, I think, favored to be exposed to all these tremendous people, all the way as far back as Catherine Kuhlman. I got to see Bishop Mason, the founder of my denomination, the, the denomination I was raised in, the Church of God in Christ. He made his transition in 1961. Well, I was born in 1953, so I was under 10 years old. I was uh, probably six or seven when I, when I saw him. But I believe I was exposed to all of that classical Pentecostalism and transcendence and fundamentalism. I, I, it has helped inform my expanded consciousness. I don't denounce it all. I, I value much of my experience of the past. I love what we call holiness, my Pentecostal transcendence. I love those old songs, even about the blood, which I don't believe in a God that demands blood sacrifices. But those songs were precious and powerful to me in the day. I can sing them now and have tears because I remember the emotion and the devotion that I felt then. Now I've expanded it to a different kind of concept of God. My vision and version of God is evolving. My visions and versions of me as a person is evolving and involving. When I say involve, I mean inwardly. There's a shifting going on and it's powerful. So heresy is that which is to be. What I'm talking is sweeping the country and the planet. I hear from people all over the world in all the continents, from all the continents and all the cultures. Muslims included, Jews included, Christians, Hindus, atheists and agnostics. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. Agnostic means I don't know. Atheist does most atheists. I'm an I'm an atheist who is a theist. When I say atheist, I don't believe in the old god, the god of my fathers. I don't. That one was mean and 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 uh paranoid and extravagant and frightening and, and ambiguous at the same time. I don't believe in that old mean monstrous God who creates hell and sends people there and judges folks and throws fiery darts and all. That's mythological images of an angry entity that people call God. In this new age, there is a revisitation. There's an enlightenment. There's a new energy that, uh, especially in the young people that we call millennials, age 19 to about 29 they don't believe that the bible is sacred uh they're not they have no interest or enticement or attraction to religion as my generation has my children love things that and are drawn differently than 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 i was they don't have the same devotions to the same things religiously or culturally I mean, you hear of, uh, you see things on television we never thought we would see. Same-sex marriages and men referring to their husbands or women referring to their wives or people having babies outside of wedlock, all many of their heroes. Then now some big celebrity 
and she's pregnant and she says, oh, we're thinking about getting married. Nobody seems to make anything of it anymore. Of course, integrated couples, something we wouldn't have seen when I was a child, I, you know, 40 years ago or, or, or sometimes barely 20 years ago. Now you see integrated couples, you see Muslims married to Jews, Catholics married to Protestants, black and whites and Asians and uh, mixed races and pluralism. It's everywhere. People are more accepting of themselves and as others. This is a changing world. I've seen all this in my lifetime and it's happening so fast. This, these little things we call iPhones and this computer I'm talking on now. Anybody in any part of the world can see and hear me now and are actually, it depends on their time zone, uh, they're watching and they're listening. Or they can. These, Of course, these programs are, these lectures are archived, so you can go back and see them later. But um, that, I can turn on music. I, I've got music on here. I can tur- take my remote and turn the TV on, and I can watch it live. I can watch what's going on. You can hear it. It's a big screen. There's light and electricity, and I'm looking at all kinds. Of, this is Chicago where I'm speaking to from tonight. There's so much happening. It's just exciting. It's, it's so thrilling. I'm not bored, not in any way. I'm more curious than I've ever been. So heresy is that which is to be. Orthodoxy is that which is passing away. The old ways are going. Orthodoxy is self-satisfied. I call it over-certitude. And intolerant of heresy. Let me say it again. Orthodoxy is self-satisfied and intolerant of heresy. Heresy is equally self-satisfied and intolerant of orthodoxy. I'm the latter. I'm self-satiated, not completely, but with where I am and evolving to. And I'm, I'll admit I am somewhat intolerant of orthodoxy. Why? I, I feel, and I shouldn't perhaps, but I, I, I'm threatened by it, not personally. I'm concerned about the human culture, the race, that orthodoxy is very defensive and protective and possessive and tends toward militancy. The word alarm is basically a call to arms in the English expression. Hold your guns. We glorify militancy and war and soldiers in all cultures. Somebody comes home dead and they become a hero. I watched and it, with grief and I actually had tears in my eyes when I was flying to, to South Africa last week. I saw in the newspaper they had these, all these young um, Iranians who looked like they were in their late teens, early 20s, just boys, heads bowed, blindfolded. There was like a, a hundred, actually 1,200, I think they said, they shot and killed. They were fighting, and they, these were religious wars. The, uh, the Ayatollah declared war. The religious leader in those cultures declared war on others of the same Muslim, a branch of Islam. And they killed those boys. And they're continuing to just shoot them in the head. And I had tears in my eyes. Those are religious wars. That's some mother's son, somebody's brother, somebody's grandson. A lot of them are somebody's husband or father. That they could just kill each other and hold their guns up and say we're going to kill more, we're going to keep on killing till this religious faction dismantles the other religious faction. That's just Muslims fighting among Muslims. Christians do the same thing. There are different branches and breaches of Judaism, branches and breaches of Christianity, branches and breaches of Islam, and the other religions. Religion can be very dangerous. And so, yes, I feel somewhat threatened by that. So I address it in a way that unveils what it really is. If it wasn't threatening and killing each other, most wars, as you heard me say earlier, are based around religion. You know when it really hit me the first time? In 1972, I did a... Uh, I was a part of a television special. We used to call, call them quarterly contact specials with Oral Roberts. <clears throat> I was a sophomore, and I just finished my freshman year in college, summer of 72. I flew from L.A. to England, London. One of the, the scenes in that special was at the Canterbury Theater, um, Cathedral in Canterbury, England. And uh, we saw the grave. When I went into the cathedrals, in fact, every cathedral I went into, Anglican or Catholic, it was basically a mausoleum to dead soldiers who had fought for the country. It was very militant. I mean, literally, I felt very awkward because I was walking on graves 
in the, the Canterbury the, uh, Cathedral. All in the walls and on the floor and in the ceiling, everything was about crusades and wars and onward Christian soldiers fighting for the right. It was all about war. Religion had become an expression of war. Fighting the good fight of faith. The word crusade, Latin word for cross is cruz. Cruz aid or cruz affixion, asphyxiation on a cross. That's what crucifixion is. The crusade, when you go in with your great evangelist to crusade into a Muslim country, crusades to them reminds them of the Christian warriors from Europe, some by foot traveling to Jerusalem with shields with a cross on it, breastplates with a cross on it, under the sign of the cross, bludgeoning Muslims. They say that blood ran up to the knees of horses uh, in, in, in the 13th and 14th century back in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Christians, onward Christian soldiers, fighting. They meant that literally. It wasn't the good fight of faith. It was a fight for the faith or for the religion that we call Christianity. So over the years, that has evolved into a symbol of glory and, and uh, um, uh, patri- uh, patriotism. Patriotism and religion are interconnected in most cultures. Whoever is the patriot fights for the religion, whether that's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, or other religions. But we're the more violent ones, particularly, and the more aggressive ones, Christianity and Islam. We're a lot more aggressive than Judaism. Judaism is not basically an aggressive, proselytizing, evangelizing type religion. But Islam and Christianity are very ambitious, very aggressive very militant, very angry. That's not the essence of most Christians' hearts. But we are influenced by this idea of us against them. A lot of exclusion in uh, exclusionism. That's why I embrace inclusion. The word Pharisee, both in Hebrew and Greek, literally means separatist. They were higher and above. I had an elitist attitude and still do. But Pharisees just in, are not just in Judaism. They're in all the religions. They're basically the fundamentalist advocates, hyper-religious, and very threatening. The Orthodox should think better of heretics. I agree. The heretics should think better of Orthodox. This is what this gentleman said. For every Orthodoxy was once a heresy, and every heresy is fated to become an Orthodoxy. For there are successive generations of ideas and institutions just as there are successive generations of people to tell the endless tale of death and life renewed. So what becomes heresy today is orthodoxy tomorrow. That's history. Look at it. All the great scientists, inventors, um, creators were once, some of them were killed whether they are Newton or Galileo, anybody that comes up with something different can be uh, tortured or executed, killed, put in jail, uh, labeled as a heretic, and, and destroyed. Somebody comes up with a non-traditional way of doing or thinking, they are immediately considered a heretic. All our states, I'm continuing with this, with this quote about heresy, all our states were founded by traitors. All the countries and cultures and religions and villages and whatever, all the ideas, all our states, even in America, were founded by traitors. Traitors of the British government. Traitors of our our, uh, English background in America. (laughs) They're all, George Washington, those who fought the Revolutionary War, those who signed the uh, the, um, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, they were all traitors to the tradition of British control. They were traitors to the throne, the monarchy, to King Edward, whoever was the king at that time, his majesty's army. (laughs) They were traitors. Every founder of a state or the state of America or the country were traitors. All our states were founded by traitors. All our churches were founded by heretics. When some, when the different religions or denominations, uh, even the Anglican church, the Anglos in Europe, King Henry VIII, I think it was, decided that he didn't want to be a Catholic because he divorced and wanted to remarry and the Catholic Church wouldn't allow that. So he created his own religion. It's called Anglican, the Anglican Church or the Church of England. 
And um, he, the, to this day, Queen Elizabeth is the head of the church. It will be followed by uh, the princes. Uh, that's religion. But all our states were founded by traitors. All our churches were founded by heretics. The patriotism of today glories in the treasons of yesterday. The patriotisms of the day. An American patriot today was a traitor yesterday. I'm talking two, three hundred years ago when America became a, a nation. In our churches, we bend the knee to cushion prayer to saints who were once dragged before the tribunals of the Orthodox and condemned and hung for their unbelief. You can name anybody from John Wesley to Martin Luther, Zwingli, uh, Hyde, a lot of the great, and the early church fathers. They were considered heretics. But now we remember them reverently. We remember, remember them with devotion. But they were once the traitors. They were once the heretics. Half of us are heretics, he goes on to say. The other half worship heretics. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Half of us are heretics. In other words, we're thinking outside the box, non-traditionalists. The other half worship past heretics. Study every religion, every denomination, every uh, community of believers in any of the religions, and you're going to find heretics were, former heretics, founded them and are now considered heroes. From heretics to heroes. Not even the Orthodox worship the Orthodox. <laughs> Every Orthodox faith is founded on some old-time heresy. The people who conform to the old never win immortal palms. History is unanimous in giving first place to those who find new paths, who think new thoughts, who build new institutions, who found new faiths. They become the heroes, but they usually are condemned or doomed or damned to death or to suffering. They're excommunicated. For the first time in my life, I know what that's like. And I'm not complaining. I'm not asking for sorrow. I'm fine. I just have to understand what's happening to me. But I've studied history long before I was ever considered a heretic. So when it happened, I wasn't so stunned. Even Jesus, whom most Christians follow, was considered a heretic from his Jewish background. There are many Jews and prophets within Judaism over the years and all the other religions who had enlightened people, men and women, mostly men were mentioned, though, though many women were enlightened first and shared it with a the man. Um, they, were, they, were, they were considered outcasts. And some of them, uh, what I've gone through, my wife and, and my children, uh, what we've gone through is much more tolerable than what other herit, so-called heretics went through. They would have killed me, but it's illegal to do that today. Otherwise, I would have been killed. I would have been imprisoned. That's what happened in Europe to anybody who broke the rules. We all like heretics. Only some of us like them alive and others like them dead. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? We all like her. This is Herbert Seeley Bigelow. We all like heretics. Only some of us like them alive and others like them dead. Even though in many ways, I've lost a lot of friends. I'm getting them back, some of them. And I found so many more new friends. What, I'm, what we call new thought is basically ancient wisdom. As Solomon of old said, that nothing is new under the sun. Egyptian mystics, thousands of years ago, were saying many of these concepts. And uh, Egyptian, I speak as the first recognize uh, civilization followed by the, uh, the by the Assyrians and then the uh, Babylonians and the Persians and the, the Greeks and then the Romans these are world empires there were several in between uh, the Christian era again is an offshoot of Judaism there was a time in history when Judaism prevailed as, a, as an empirical power though not globally it's never been the global reach. Christianity did that for as as uh, as an offshoot of Judaism, but these are all important observations. Now, 
I posted this today and I've gotten thousands of views and responses. According to the New Testament narratives of the Gospels, both Jesus and John Baptist, his forerunner, came preaching repentance, which means to rethink, as I said, to reconsider, or after you've thought, think again. That's all I'm talking about as, a, as, a, uh, um, as my inclusive, expanded consciousness of Carlton Pearson, the heretic. I'm saying let's rethink. For the last 15 years, my objective has been the same as it was with Jesus and John the Baptist and others, to encourage us all to ask what we believe, why we believe it, how those beliefs add to or subtract on the quality of our lives and those around us. Not just what you believe, because what you believe does influence and sometimes impact those around you, from your families to your foes, quote-unquote foes. You really don't have enemies except your thoughts. But we influence people. Many of us have the feeling that Christianity, at its core, has something good to offer the human race. Now, I'm quoting this book. My friend Moosey, in, the, in his introduction, I made an introduction, then he had a, a forward. Many of us have the feeling that Christianity at its core has something good f- to offer the human race. At the same time, we have the sense that the version of Christianity we see on television, hear about in political and social debates, or see in most fundamentalist churches, is not the kind of Christianity we can call home anymore. This is the type of Christianity that makes us feel ashamed to call ourselves Christians. This is the Christianity that has divided people into the chosen and the unchosen. This is the type of Christianity, or religion I add, that embraces the ugly image of God as written about in Bishop Shel- uh, John Shelby Spung's book, Jesus for the Non-Religion. Uh, written, uh, Jesus for the Non-Religious. Here's a quote from him. He endorsed both of my books. I consider him a very personal and powerful friend. I love this man. Musi quotes him in his book. Christianity, I'm quoting Bishop Spung, has through the inerrant, quote-unquote, Bible, given us a God who caused the death of his son, the damnation of disbelievers, the subordination of women, the bloody massacres of the Crusades, the terror of judgment, the wrath toward homosexuals, and the justification of slavery. The Father God embodied in the creeds is a deity who chooses some of the world's children while rejecting others. He is the father of wrath, the father of male domination and female submission, the father of literal and spiritual slavery. Slavery, end of quote. That's John Shelby Spung. Is this your experience in any way? I added that to the post. How do you experience God or your religion supposedly rep- representing God? This book, I encourage you to download it as soon as it's available uh, online. It is a powerful, intelligent, scholarly, historical, and scientific presentation. So much good stuff in it. And I'm going to keep talking about it to you uh, over the next few weeks as I'm, uh, I just think it's important for you to receive. Jesus was, this is Anton Mesmer, Jesus was the man. Christ was the science. Anton Mesmer. We get our English word mesmerized from Mr. Mesmer's name because of his enchanting philosophies and scientifically mystical teachings. It means mesmerization. It means to hold the attention of someone to the exclusion of all else or so as to transfix them. Religion has done that. Religion is mesmerizing. It has mesmerized millions and billions the world over. But Anton Mesmer made that statement. Jesus is the man Christ is the science, or I would say the knowing. I say Jesus was in touch with his Christ self. He was an evolved person, an exalted consciousness. He was mystical. Most know, many know the history of Christ, but they don't know the mystery or the missed story of Christ because that transcends Jesus. Jesus was the man, Christ is the knowledge. Prolific statement. Prolific statement. It's like listening, uh, mesmerization is like, being mesmerized is like listening to your favorite preacher or teacher or speaker. It could be a book or a movie or even music. I believe that Jesus was a metaphysician. Do you consider yourself metaphysical or does the term intimidate you? I hadn't heard much about metaphysics and I saw it as some kind of spooky goofy, frightening, intimidating, boarding on devils and evil or new age. And, you know, you hear all this stuff. There's so much paranoia in religion. And uh, I spent a lot of my life experiencing that paranoia unawaringly or perhaps willingly, if not eagerly. It was uncomfortable, but I thought that was part of 
faith. When I use the word metaphysical, I'm connecting the world of science of mind to the branch of philosophy that studies ontology. Ontology is the uh, philosophical study of the nature of being or of becoming, of existence, of reality. At, at this second half of my life, or the last half of my life on this earth realm, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about being and becoming. I'm curious about existence. I'm curi- curious about reality, whatever that is. It's kind of a, an indefinable word, but you can describe it by saying experience, whatever existence or experience you are. These are all fascinating spiritual and scientific mysteries, but I'm very curious about them. Metaphys- uh, metaphysical uh, ontology deals with the questions concerning what entities or realities exist and or can be said to exist and how such entities can be grouped or related to a larger, more practical reality. What does all this mean? Are you curious or confused? <laughs> Good. For both. Because eventually you're going to work and walk through your confusion and your curiosity. And some of those, in some ways, those terms are inextricably connected. The word conscience basically means con with, in Espanol, science, with knowledge. Omniscience, 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 something most people believe God is, means all-knowing or knowing all. All you really know is what you've experienced. Or experimented, what you've tested. That's all you really know. You may believe one thing, but you, all you know is what you've tested. And there is knowledge that transcends faith or religion. I challenge you to seek it. Because it's seeking you. Remember what you want, wants you. It's seeking you. And you're seeking it. That's, that's why you're experiencing life as you are experiencing it. Oh, it's a powerful revelation of who you are and who you aren't as we close. It's, it's incredible who you are becoming, what it means to become that, what it means to be that, what, that mean, what it means to evolve into that. Are you willing? Are you eager? Let me remind you as I close to, uh, you can go right there online, bishoppearson.com, and check out our trip to Israel in 2015. Oh, one of my cousin and his wife just called me tonight from San Diego are coming. My godson called from back east. He's coming. Uh, and you can put a little money away. It's going to cost probably a couple of 3000 uh, all together, you know, to get over there. But that covers everything, all taxes and experiences. But it's October of 2015. You've got over a year to begin to plan. We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to Haifa up north to the... To the um, World Headquarters for the Baha'i Faith. We're going to talk with Jews, Hindus, Druids, Christians, Muslims. We're going to go to all these holy sites. Yes, the, uh, the River Jordan, if you want to be baptized into new th- ways of thinking, we'll baptize you. We'll spend time at the Mediterranean, the Sea of Galilee, all the special spots of all the different religions. Even our same gender-loving brothers and sisters are coming. And we're going to have conversations because there's a huge same gender-loving community within Israel. We're going to go to Tel Aviv and meet with gay brothers and sisters of the Jewish culture first time this has ever been done this way uh, the most radically inclusive peace tour ever experienced or expressed in Israel that we know of and my host Ron Wexler tells me that he is actually a consultant to the Prime Minister of Israel we're going to have a great time and if you want to support what we're doing push the donate button, send any amount we don't charge for these people are talking to me about charging for these lectures, anybody anywhere in the world can go, there's about, this may be the 81st or 82nd hour-long lecture I've given. People spend hours on the site just listening. And we welcome every one of you. We not only welcome you, we want you. Even if you disagree and say and express that, we're inclusionists. We'll, we'll work and walk through it. At least you're listening. At least you're looking. At least you're curious. So we welcome you as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your consciousness. As I love to say, God richly bless you and be you. You like that? God bless you. God be you. (laughs) Thanks for your time tonight. Much love. Goodbye now.